Hi everyone, so welcome to today's webinar. Next slide, please. Again, welcome to today's webinar on getting the supports you need from mental health providers. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center or MHTTC, housed at Rutgers School of Health Professions in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. My name is Kathy and I'm the project coordinator of this center and will be facilitating the webinar today. Next slide, please. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health and other related workforces to deliver evidence-based and empirically supported practices to individuals with mental illnesses. But please visit the MHTTC Network website for additional information at mhttcnetwork.org. Slide, please. The MHTTC Oh, I'm oh, sorry. If you're interested in staying up to date with the events and products the Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC is providing, please sign up to receive our email communications and you can sign up at the bit.ly link provided on the screen. Right. Following the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback and use it to improve our activities and inform future activities. The surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to the completion of these surveys. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. And we also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with the PowerPoint slides in the next couple of days. And we also encourage you to interact with our presenter during the webinar by using the chat feature. Please feel free to post any comments or questions you have in the chat and I'll collect your questions as we go and ask them of the presenter during the Q&A time towards the end of the presentation. During the webinar, our presenter may pose questions to you. So please use the chat feature to answer those questions. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA. All material appearing in this presentation except that taken directly from copyrighted sources is in the public domain and may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. At the time of this presentation, Eleanor McCants-Katz is serving as SAMHSA Assistant Secretary. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the presenters and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS, SAMHSA, for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. Now let's begin our webinar. We have Dr. Michelle Zechner with us today. Dr. Zechner is an assistant professor at Rutgers within the Department of Psychiatric Re Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions and has focused her career on the promotion of health and wellness for people with mental health conditions, their families, and the staff who support them for over 25 years. She has worked in a variety of settings, including academia, outpatient mental health programs, psychiatric hospitals, nursing homes and training services. She conducts research, teaches and mentors students and consults with state psychiatric hospitals on the implementation of evidence-based mental health practices. Her research interests include health promotion interventions for people living with mental health conditions, preparing mental health and health professionals to work with people with mental health conditions, multidimensional wellness, developing comprehensive health promotion interventions to improve the health of older adults and motivation for physical activity. She has co-authored peer reviewed and technical publications on health promotion, evidence-based practices and interprofessional initiatives to improve health for people living with mental illnesses. She's a sought after trainer and has given presentations locally and nationally on topics ranging from wellness and recovery, aging with mental illness, supporting mental health staff self-care and health promotion strategies for people with mental health conditions. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Zechner and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really glad uh, that all of you could join me today and welcome to you all. Um, 
we're going to be talking about getting the supports that we need. And I know that for many of us who work in the mental health field, we're really good at supporting other people and maybe a little less uh less good. Uh, that's not a, that's not proper English, but it's, it's a little ch more challenging for us to get our uh, supports for ourselves. So for today, I wanted to explore the expectations that we have of ourselves, challenges that we currently face, and then talk about how some of those interact together and getting some of the care that we need. Uh, next, we'll talk about thinking through who uh, and how we can get support for ourselves when we're challenged. And sometimes when it's really important for us to get support and help that we need. And throughout this presentation, I encourage you to think about your own situation and what supports you might need right now. This has been an unprecedented year. It's changed the way many of us do things. The world is a changed place and in crisis. There's been quick changes in the way we do our work, the way we live, with fewer in-person events and how we relax and spend our leisure time. For many of us, there's been a financial impact related to losing jobs, reduced hours or pay, or our partners losing income that put extra financial pressure on families. Many families have been challenged by remote learning and daycare services available. And when you add the pandemic stress on top of the regular job stress and the season now of the holidays and changes in how we spend our time together, it really does add up to needing some extra care and support right now. With these challenges, self-compassion is critical. And we should remind ourselves that everybody needs help during a crisis, even us. So my colleagues and I just published a paper that looked at some of the challenges faced by mental health providers this year. And we found so many difficulties that arose from providing services via the telephone or on the internet or some kind of telehealth or even through doors or windows. Our work every day to help other people manage their difficult emotions around life situations have been even more difficult um, through the current pandemic. This really takes a toll on us because we're helpers and we want to make a difference in the lives of others. We help people facing very difficult situations like homelessness, loss, grief, substance use, or other crises every day. On top of a stressful job in the best of times, we add in the extreme challenges of COVID. Our clients are also likely to be experiencing distress. At work, the logistics of doing our work through telehealth, getting masks or other PPE for ourselves and our clients, and supporting very vulnerable people during isolation of the pandemic. And at home, we're trying to manage what's going on in our family and our personal lives. All of these factors put us at greater risk for compassion fatigue and even burnout as we stop caring, maybe uh, a little bit or at all, and go numb or alternately, we might be able to shut off our work and be in a permanent state of crisis, trying to help others in their crises. Add to that the holiday stress, this year is unlike any other year. And we're going to be facing anniversaries, personal losses that may have taken place recently of losing our friends, family members, clients, and even coworkers and unable to manage the way we would in normal times. That's a really big list. And I'm sure that I left out a lot of things that are adding stress to your life. All of that is really to say, I know we've got a lot going on. I know you've got a lot going on. And right now today, we have so much more that we're facing than we used to. Now more than ever, we're likely to need some additional supports to keep us going and staying balanced. Our helping tendencies mean we might be less likely to ask for help. I had, that's why I had to have the superheroes, right? Sorry that it's a pink cape, you know, it could be blue, it could be purple, whatever, yellow, gold, whatever. Um, we may even be getting the message that we shouldn't be asking for help. Um, we have to be strong, we are the heroes, that we have to be available all the time, that we're the one that people depend on. We're the frontline workers, we have to do it 
because no one else will. If I don't do it, maybe it won't get done or it won't be done the right way. I know I fall into that trap thinking that I have to be the one to hold it together. I'm supposed to be the hero here. And I, I'm saying that, but I'm sort of I'm sort of joking, but I'm not joking. <laughs> I don't know about you. Um, and if I ask for help, it, it's going to mean that I'm weak or unfit maybe to help other people, which is kind of not true, but I still tell myself that. We're told that we're heroes and we get recognition for overworking and not taking breaks. And in crisis situations, we even have more pressure or guilt placed on us to care for our clients or service recipients. Those messages can really be discouraging from getting our, uh, getting our needs met or even seeing ourselves as someone who needs a support and assistance just like every other person. I wonder if there are any other beliefs or expectations that you might have put on yourself in these times. So I'm going to ask if you would share. Uh, I'd love to hear from some of you. What are some expectations you have of yourself right now that may be a little more than what you might expect of others? If you just go ahead and chat in the uh, type in the chat box uh, some examples. I'll give you a moment to do that if you want to share some things that you're expecting from yourself that you might not expect um, from others. I know that for me, I fall into that trap that I have to be strong and I can't, I'm responsible for everyone in the world. Someone said being able to take some time off, falling into that expectation of I'm not allowed to take any time off. I know I've felt that a lot in the last few months. Someone also said being the perfect homeschool teacher, guidance counselor, wife and mother. Yes, absolutely. Putting that expectation, we're going to be perfect in all of our roles. Giving, having the expectation that we have all of the answers. We don't. And the long hours. Um, some people are making themselves available after hours that when other counselors don't. And then that feeling that I have to be constantly productive, absolutely. I, I think it's been really, really a challenge uh, in this time to feel productive when the way we work is very much changed. And a lot of people are feeling like they are even more under pressure to be the helper because pe so many people are not doing well. I know I've, I've experienced that too. And people are saying that they have to respond to uh, all emails that they get at all times of the day. And I, I know I, I, I feel like I, I've shared a few of mine. You all have shared some of yours. And it's definitely, uh, it's a challenging time. And some of that is the expectation and pressure that we have of ourselves and that we're not giving ourselves permission to be humans. And some people say that they're even feeling guilty that they're employed. I can understand that. Um, and being accountable and reachable during telehealth. It's a lot. And juggling home and work, definitely. There's a lot going on. So let's turn for a moment. Uh, we talked about expectations and challenges to getting support. Let's look at Lisa's story for a minute. And I, I made this up loosely based on someone I know. Lisa works in an outpatient and supervises three staff. She's both administrative and clinical responsibilities. She often works 12 hour days trying to catch up on documentation. She has multiple meetings each day, leaving her no time for personal breaks or to catch her breath. Lisa hasn't taken a day off in five months. She feels completely overwhelmed and notices that it's getting harder for her to connect with her clients and staff. And we're not even going to talk about uh, what's happening in her home life. So what do you think? What expectation did Lisa have for herself? Um, I think some of you have already mentioned that in the chat, the, the expectation that Lisa had. I'm going to just go back here for a second. Um, that Lisa looks like she doesn't want to take any time off or feels that she can't uh, take any time off. And I think some of you brought that up as an expectation that you have as, of yourself. 
Uh, any other expectation that Lisa has for herself right now that might be a little bit off? She has an expectation. She has to show her staff that she's strong, right? And that's modeling too, right? Because so if she's working 12 hour days and she's not taking time off, she's showing, um, she's sort of showing that it's, it's okay. It's good not to take time off. It's good to work long hours. And sometimes we have to do that. I understand. I, I work in mental health. Uh, but if we do that for a prolonged period of time, we put ourselves at great risk for health problems, for stress, for burning out, for compassion fatigue. So nice job. Any, and the challenges that Lisa is um, facing really is that she's not giving herself any time. I literally heard the person that I based this off on saying that she didn't have time to, for, I call them bio breaks, where you need a snack, you need to hit the restroom. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have time for that, you're uncomfortable and you're grumpy and it's it's really hard to do your work. All right. Um, and someone said she might be facing burnout. Good point. It, it sounds like she might be facing burnout. Definitely compassion fatigue if it's getting harder and harder for her to connect with her clients and staff, for sure. And she needs to ask for other people to cover her to give her a break. Right. Absolutely. So, we have to think about managing our self expectations, being aware of what pressures we put on ourselves. Just like Lisa, many of us have expectations that are pretty high. Maybe we don't think we should take a few minutes before our next client, or maybe we feel like we can't take any days off, which we've already talked about. Or maybe we think we're the only ones who could fix the problem. Now, let's talk about what to do with our self-expectations that push us too hard. First off, notice the expectations you have of what you should be doing. Identify the things that you place on yourself to accomplish. Again, that those messages like, I'm the only one who could do this task the right way. And one way to challenge that expectation is to say to yourself, if I'm not there, it will get done. Maybe not my way, but everything will be okay. It's really important to differentiate between your expectations of yourself, or let's just call it my sense of perfectionism, <laughs> um, versus what's really expected of you. You may do some of this work with your clients, but noticing our own thoughts uh, that something might be a little bit off or a cognitive distortion from the truth, like over generalizing. If I'm not there, it won't get done. Well, a lot of things get done when we're not around. Um, maybe not the way we would do it, but they sometimes get done. Or the should, you know, don't should yourself. Uh, I should be doing more to help right now. Um, sometimes that should message is a sign of an expectation. We should all check out our expectations and ask ourselves, is that true? Like the, I should be doing more, stopping yourself for a moment and saying, is that true? Reflect on that for a little while and see what comes out. We also have to be aware and recognize our own anxiety and grief during this difficult time. I read something wonderful uh, a few months ago and it was like, you know, I'm doing this, you know, totally different kind of work now because of, of the pandemic. Um, and the person said, no, you're not doing totally different work. You're, you're doing very hard work and it's a pandemic. So the idea that, that the pandemic, it's just another layer that makes doing all of our work, our family life, our self-care more difficult. So being aware of that anxiety and grief when it comes up, Taking note, writing it down, talking to someone is really, really uh, a valuable thing to do. And it can be hard for us because when we're vulnerable, then do, do we feel like we can still help others in that time? So taking the right moment, you know, of a break or in the evening to really reflect on how you're doing, it can be really important uh, in terms of providing supports for others. And sometimes, I'm just speaking for myself, of course, I don't want to put anything on anybody else, but emotions rise up and make themselves known, even at work. I don't know about you, but I've had those moments at work where I'm like, oh my goodness, 
as we've been saying, this is a really stressful time. And it's important to acknowledge that for yourself, to, to own it, to let, to hear it, to basically hear yourself say, this is a really hard time. I'm doing the best that I can. Most mental health professionals are likely to feel intense pressure in these days, giving caseloads, infection risks, new ways of doing business, personal and professional losses, and financial concerns. Feeling overwhelmed, burned out, or stressed is not a sign of weakness. It's not weakness, but it's healthy. It's really healthy to notice what's going on inside of you, and it means you can address the challenges. It's, I have a cautionary note, and it's something to consider. Some of us, and I say us because I've had this experience too, may actually, I don't want to say addicted, that's a little bit too strong of a word, but we may actually really enjoy the chaos of crisis and feel it's invigorating and exciting. And I know, you know, I've had those periods, those jobs when I had the beeper and, and I was really holding that beeper and I was like, I was living for the excitement. That excitement is uh, it can really wear on you. Even if you're the kind of person who likes a lot of change and a lot of disruption uh, going on at work, that can really take its toll, particularly now. Sometimes the ongoing crisis is too much and it really becomes too exhausting. And it's hard to be in crisis for months at a time, right? So notice if you're feeling tired or sad or overwhelmed and give yourself a break. That might be your feelings knocking on the door or reminding you to take a break. So feel those feelings. Get the emotion out by talking to people, using your supports, or practicing self-care. A great way to manage emotions, especially grief and loss, is to get support. Giving support means that we're giving assistance to someone so they can function. This is probably you talked about with your clients quite a lot. But what does it mean for us to receive support? That means we receive assistance from someone or something else so that we can function. It can be small things like a friendly email or text or something more meaningful like a gift or getting advice for a problem or even counseling. I know it's not always easy for us being the heroes, the helpers, the healthcare workers to ask for help or to receive it, but we all need help and support at some point in our lives. I know this is a message. <laughs> I realize I'm saying this a lot, but I know that sometimes we need to hear it a lot. So forgive me for, for driving home the point a moment. Um, also, as a quick reminder, Getting support from other people is a healthy response when people, uh, when things are getting tough. People who receive support during difficult times have better health outcomes, feel less stressed out, report increased happiness, and actually live longer than those who don't get support. That's a, that's a kind of an important point there that we're doing ourselves a favor when we get support, not only in the short term, but in the long term. So now I'm kind of curious, we're going to, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to ask you to think about where you get your own support, but where do you turn when you need support or when you start to feel a little overwhelmed and that you may need someone to lean on? Our social Social network is a great place to start, and that could be our partners, friends, family, religious leader, anywhere that you get your social connections, neighbors. Another thing to consider are more formal helpers, such as peer supports, support groups, counselors, or coaches. Sometimes our environment can support us. Being in nature is actually uh, associated with an increase in well-being and positive emotions, especially if you're moving, like walking or jogging. These days, many people find support via online platforms, social media, or even texts. Meaningful buildings, such as places of worship or faith, may be a supportive uh, place for you. For me, my home has been a place of support. I put some plants, you can't see them, I put some plants in the room and a comfortable chair to stare at the trees when I'm not working so that I can feel supported. 
some people find work to be a place of support to get uh, from their colleagues, supervisors, supervisors, human resources, or employee assistance programs. I had to put in pets because I have pets and I love my pets. And sometimes the best moment of support for me during the day is to take a time out or pause with my pets and just uh, be. So now I'm really curious. Uh, someone's already, already gone ahead. Let's hear from you now. Where do you get your support? People have said nature, walking, outdoor, and chores. Watching comedy, documentaries, playing guitar, family, working out, reading, being with children, weightlifting, spending time with family, yoga and music and cats of course cats uh, some people are, are are reporting art that's wonderful support and traveling yeah i i love i love traveling i really miss it too uh, i i travel virtually now and so i plan the trips that i'm going to take one day um, and someone else says cooking and cooking is a wonderful wonderful way to get support for yourself. Um, we have theme nights at my house. Maybe you do that too. We come up with a, a theme, an idea, and then we try to listen to music and the food of the culture. And we read articles about that place. So we can imagine that we've traveled. And then video games, definitely. Uh, whatever makes you feel centered and uh, supported. And prayer, absolutely, and motivational videos. We all need support and it looks very different for everyone. Um, you're welcome for the theme night uh, idea. That's, yes, we've, my, I, my husband and I have been trying theme nights um, to cheer us up. <laughs> so thank you for sharing all of your, your places that you get supports. You, you've probably given us some ideas of, of what we might try in the future. We've talked about our challenges, our self expectations, and where we might get additional support when you need it. But it's not always easy to ask for help. Do you have trouble asking for help? I know I'm not very good at it. There's such a culture, at least in my circles of mental health, that getting help is a sign of weakness. Even though we're mental health providers, that if we ask for help, we're not being good enough or strong enough. Our ability to reach out for help also might be linked about how we think about ourselves. You would think that being in mental health field, we would be less likely to have stigma in seeking help, especially support for our emotional well-being. But ironically, I haven't seen that to be the case. You, you might, in your culture, in your mental health culture, in your work, may see that support. But in the places that I've worked, it's been, uh, it's been quite different. How easy is it for you to ask for what you need? Is help a four-letter word? Of course it is, but is it a bad four-letter word in your vocabulary? Just sit for a moment and think, on a scale of one to 10, how likely will you ask for help when you need it? With one being not at all and 10 being, I'm the first one in line for help. I'd have to rate myself like probably a three. I'm really not good. But someone else says they're a five and a three <laughs> and a four, <laughs> a five. Okay, I, I haven't seen anyone break eight. Okay, I see one person, depends on the situation. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, and also I think, you know, Leanne brought a great uh, point up and it's context. And that is, if you're working in a supportive work environment, you might be very likely to ask for help. And if you're not ask, uh, working in a supportive work environment, you may be much less likely to ask for help. So that's important to take into account as well. Um, but I do know in general, I, I noticed just making, you know, I didn't run statistics on this, but most of you said a five or less, I'm just, just saying. So I, I think it's not uncommon for mental health uh, providers to struggle with asking for help. 
So now I'd like to hear from you. Why is it important to get support for yourself? Why do you think that we should be getting support for ourselves? I know for me, I think about it as the oxygen mask uh, analogy, right? You're on the airplane, you're supposed to pull down the oxygen mask, put it on your face first, and then turn to the person who needs assistance and put their oxygen mask on. But it's not always easy. So I'm asking, why do you think you should get support for yourself? And someone says, how can we be best for others without being our best self? Absolutely. So I can be effective for my patients and those I supervise. Yeah, someone says, I'm the lifeguard. If I go down, who will assist the client? Absolutely. And being the oxygen mask. So I think it's really important to, to sit with that thought for a little while um, of why get support for yourself, because in a way, I, I know, I'm assuming that many of us know or use motivational strategies or motivational um, interviewing and building, uh, you know, building some momentum around getting the help is kind of the first step, which is why I asked this for you. Why get support for your, yourself? Because we all are going to need it at some point and uh, to kind of work on those barriers ahead of time <laughs> might be good. And people are saying, you know, it's such a relief when you do ask for help. And I've experienced that too, um, definitely, that when you do ask for help, you know, you've got too much on your plate, you've got uh, a, too big of a caseload, you've taken, you know, you've been on call, I, I call it beeper, and I'm sorry, it's just how I, how I grew up in the field with a beeper, but uh, I realize now it's a phone call. Being on call too long, uh, it really is wearing and can reduce your sense of compassion and increase your uh, likelihood of burnout and stress. And someone says you can't pour from an empty cup. Absolutely. So you've got to have a little something in there to be able to share with others and support others. Um, and it's not selfish at all to focus on yourself first to make sure that you have the ability and strength to do that. So the first step in getting the support you need is to ask. Boy, that sounds obvious, right? But for me, again, I, I'm just saying for me, and I imagine for a lot of people, it's really hard to ask for help. You can ask for people uh, that ask people that you trust for support and help when you need it. Maybe even before you're in full tilt, overwhelmed and suffering. I don't know, has anyone heard of the pre-ask? Um, and the pre-ask for help is thinking about the future and thinking, you know what, that week my mom is going in for surgery. Um, I'm going to have to be taking care of my child on my own. I've got another client who uh, is being discharged from the hospital. There's a lot going on. I think I need to make sure that I reserve time for myself. So I don't know if, if that would be ever an idea to consider. It would be the pre-ask to assess yourself and say, I'm coming up, it's going to be stressful, and I'm going to need some time to sort of take a break uh, and having a little more support in advance before you hit the wall. Um, yes, I'm just reading some of the comments. It's hard to say I need help. Yeah, it is really hard to say I need help. It's very, very hard. And I think we need as a mental health field to get a little bit better at supporting our peers and ourselves and saying, yeah, we, we all need help. We all need help. And when we need help, it's it's going to make us a much better provider. It's going to be a, make us a better person, a better family member, a better human being if we get the support that we need when we need it. So let's talk about some of the warning signs. When should we ask? start asking for help or extra support? You're going to know this for yourself, uh, but sometimes there are other other ways to think about it. I, I think that we probably recognize some of the dramatic signs when we need extra support, but sometimes these subtle things that come up might suggest that we're struggling. And, and if you think about it, for anyone who's done rap planning or uh, anything like that, where you're doing uh, work with a client, where you're sort of saying, 
what are your early warning signs? What are your triggers? Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here, the early warning signs for us. Getting uh, So some of the warning signs that we uh, of compassion fatigue are listed. So blaming others, being easily frustrated or irritable for an ongoing period of time is a sign you might benefit from extra support. As is feeling tired, exhausted, or overwhelmed most days. Another sign is sadness and tearfulness or feeling empty or indifferent. They're kind of different ends of the spectrum, but if you're feeling too much or you're feeling too little, that's kind of a warning sign. Poor self-care. And this actually comes from the CDC and they talk about personal hygiene. That's, that's sort of interesting. So poor self-care, uh, if that comes up for you, might indicate that you're uh, really struggling. Also, if you withdraw socially or feel disconnected from your social network and stop connecting with your family or friends, that's a risk. Also being easily startled um, or unable to let go of work situations. I've had jobs uh, where I you know, worked on call and I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning and be worried about a client who I was very concerned about. And that was the time at which I, I think I was experiencing compassion fatigue in retrospect. Um, I was unable to let go of some of those work situations. Also nightmares. If, if uh, someone is experiencing nightmares about work or other topics, it might be time to get some help. Some of the stress, you know, can actually accumulate and then uh, turn into other physiological signs like shaking or having intense headaches or pain, you know, neck and shoulder pain when that gets too painful. It's also really important to notice if, if we feel like we're being a failure. If you start thinking or if someone you know starts thinking that nothing you could do will help or that you're not doing your job well, on a consistent basis, it's time that you need to talk to someone about that. Um, we're all doing the best we can and some days we're going to have better days than others, but Acknowledging the work that you're doing is incredibly important, especially uh, during these times. And lastly, if you need alcohol or other substances to cope with your life, you should probably consider some extra support. The CDC suggests if these continue for more than a month, it's really time to get mental health support for yourself. And some of the more obvious things that we probably uh, have seen in our clients and we might see in ourselves when you experienced these uh, symptoms or signs on a day-to-day -day basis. So if your life is really impacted on a day-to-day -day basis by worry or sadness or irritability and anger, it's time to get professional assistance. And that can include other signs like changes in eating or sleeping, whether it's not being able to sleep or sleeping too much, having excessive fear, worry, or anxiety, withdrawal, as we talked about, difficulty coping with problems and activities. So if things that you normally do and handle no problem start to feel overwhelming, that's when it's time to get some support. And the prolonged uh, sadness and irritability, as, as we said. There is help available and out there. I've listed a national 24-hour crisis center. If you or someone you know needs to speak to someone now or sometime in the future. Also, in times of crisis, always call 911 for immediate assistance in your area. So let's go back to, we've talked about sort of the when to get help. Um, let's take a moment to think about the support uh, that we might need. And I think that that's no, not always easy to say, I need help, but what help do I need? It can be helpful to think about it and break problems or difficulties down into smaller pieces, just like we would for our clients. So you can think it through and identify what you need. First off, what's the challenge or problem you're experiencing in the moment? Next, what help do you need? 
something more informal from friends or family, or more support from a person or place. Think about the resources you have in your life right now, and then try to identify what type of help is needed. Again, is it just a quick phone call? Is it uh, a small loan? What are the immediate problems that you're facing? Or do you prefer going to a support group or a faith community to get the support that you need? When you ask for help, it's really best if you could try to be clear about what you need from the person. Whether you need a person to cover a shift, watch a child, give you feedback about an encounter with a client, or get help for feelings of sadness and hopelessness. It's also really important to try to get support from more than one place. You're more likely to be able to get the support you need if you spread the love, spread the, spread the help, uh, or spread the requests, excuse me, and then you're more likely to get the support that you need. So we talked about Lisa before and the pressures and challenges she was experiencing. So based on what we were just talking about, what are some of the things that Jamal might uh, do to get the supports that he needs? So Jamal works in housing. He often takes on extra shifts and works on call. He doesn't have much free time and is finding himself more and more resentful. He doesn't like to talk about his work to his friends. Jamal is considering a job in another field. And what are Jamal's challenges? And if you can write those in the chat if you like. Um, Jamal is really not interested in working in mental health anymore, it looks like. Um, that's one of the challenges that he's experiencing. And he's feeling resentful. That's another challenge. He also doesn't feel like he wants to talk to his friends. <laughs> Jamal needs to find another job in another field, LOL. Yeah, maybe. No time to take care of himself. He's burned out, no breaks. He may need a peer to talk to. That's a great suggestion. And it's okay to decide that a field isn't right for you. But he's certainly pushing himself pretty hard. And well, if we go back to that expectations, like the expectations that Jamal has, he's, he's kind of the I'm doing it on, on my own kind of um, uh, route, which means he's not necessarily reaching out or using his supports because he's got friends. And what might he need? Uh, definitely a peer and who, his friends or colleagues. How would Jamal ask? What do you think that Jamal might say to a colleague or a peer to start the discussion. Someone says he needs to not take on extra work, <laughs> take a break. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Amy says, um, ask if, if the peer or friend is feeling the same way. Yeah, because it might be a really, really difficult situation um, and or to just get some feedback from a colleague, yeah. So I'd like, now we've talked about a couple of different people, we've talked about different strategies. I'd like to take a moment and encourage you to apply some of these ideas about support to your own life. Think about yourself and your situation. You don't have to put it in chat, but just think for a moment. How would you answer those questions for yourself? You might consider jotting some of these down or the thoughts down uh, and I'm going to give you some questions. So what might be going on in your own life that might need some support? Just think about that for a moment. And what challenges are you facing in your own life? What expectations do you have for yourself, both realistic and unrealistic? Who could support you right now? What kinds of support would be helpful for you?
once you've gone through that sort of process, I'm going to go back to uh, this is the process. Once you've gone through the process of identifying the challenge, the help, and who can help you, it, it might be a really good activity uh, to sort of think that through for yourself. And the next step would be to reflect on what holds you back from getting the support you need. So taking a moment to, to reflect, someone, someone shared, uh, yeah, it's people are finding wor working from home challenging as well as working in the field. So take a moment now. I know you all have thought through those scenarios in your head. And I'm, I don't, we don't need, you know, unless you feel like you want to, you don't need to share those thoughts. But I'm curious, what holds you back from getting the supports you need? And someone says, trying to find supports that are not available. I think for me, what holds me back from getting the support I need is feeling guilty, you know, comparing myself to others and thinking, wow, I have a job, I have a house, uh, I really shouldn't have any needs, I should be fine on my own. Uh, that definitely holds me back from getting support that I need. Anyone else? Not being able to see other people because of COVID, that definitely can, can hold you back. And not feeling judged that you don't want to put in a 60 plus hour work week. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's likely to be a lot more pressure right now because of staff shortages, because of the increase in need, because of all of the chaos. Our services are in high demand. And again, if we don't put that oxygen mask on ourselves, we're not going to be able to continue to do our work. Also, feeling like you can't burden others with the challenges that you're experiencing. Yeah. And being afraid that the help that you get is not what you expect. Absolutely. And it's important to sort of think it through. And if a specific support isn't available, to think through what is it about that support that I need? So if, you know, let's, I'm just making something up. Let's say um, a support group for uh, single mothers who are educating their kids online and work in mental health. That might not be a support group that's available but a support group for single mothers might be available. And admitting that you can't do what you normally do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you thinking through that hard question with me. So just a little sort of shot in the arm encouragement. It, how to address those barriers that we were talking about. Keep reminding yourself that asking for help is healthy and a sign of strength, and it's completely normal. Give yourself permission to be someone who needs a little help from friends, like the song says. Try and let go of any self-talk that interferes with getting supports. Self-compassion is a wonderful tool that is caring for yourself as you would a very good friend. What would you wish for your good friend right now? What advice would you give to your good friend if they were having a rough time? So let's talk about the supports you already have in place. You guys are amazing. Just looking at the chat, I could see some people who are incredibly integrated in their communities, who have strong networks, who are really reflective and thinking about their practice. So you've got that in your favor. And you probably have some other supports that you have to address some of these challenges that we were talking about. Identify what you do and what you have and what you can do to offer yourself more support. Work practices. There are strategies that can be supportive, like 
rotate schedules when it's possible. Partner with a colleague or a buddy to check in with one another. Another one I recently found, which I thought was so interesting, was a create a checkout practice to acknowledge your success for the day and transition into home life. Give yourself a little bumper if possible, even if you're working from home. Do the best you can at work. Being perfect is not the goal right now, or ever really. It's managing. Acknowledge that you are making a difference and helping. Reflect on what went well, even if it's tiny, if it's a tiny thing. You came in, you joined us today. That was a tiny, you know, one step in the right direction. And how you managed today, given the limitations of the situation. Talk to people about what's going on in your life, your challenges and expectations. Reach out to people that you know who care about you and tell them about your struggles if you feel that you can. Breathe. <sighs> that sounds like a silly thing to say. I always say it to people and they're like, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but as we get more distressed by a situation, we're likely to take short breaths, which might trigger our bodies to go into fight or flight mode. By regulating our breathing, slowing it down, we can calm our bodies and then our minds. Breathing is a simple technique you could do anywhere that can offer support. One suggestion is the four by four or square breath. Another one I've just learned about is the four, seven, eight. This is a similar idea where you inhale for four beats, hold for seven and exhale through your mouth for eight beats. Other relaxation practices are also very helpful as a support. And then healthy lifestyle, I know, I, I feel funny talking about this, but just aiming for those healthier choices will also be a support to your well-being. I've been on a binge with jelly bellies and I notice that every time I go wild with the jelly bellies, I really am cranky the next day and I'm realizing I'm not doing a great job supporting myself with my jelly belly addiction. Uh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But trying to maintain a healthy diet, limit caffeine in particular because that rubs you up, and alcohol, trying to get some adequate sleep and some movement, even if it's standing up, even if it's going up and down the steps in your house. Uh, also, journaling regularly, of course, can help us uh, with our feelings. Someone, someone just uh, said, uh, Sometimes we need to listen to Nancy Reagan and just say no. <laughs> I think that's great. Boundaries, boundaries, pressure and guilt. It's so normal, especially right now. The pressure and guilt is normal. Um, we've been in this crisis and we have to know what our boundary is and when we need to limit our work. If possible, it's really best to limit work to less than 12 hours a day. And for me, it's definitely got to be less than 10 hours when I can. Know that it's okay that it's okay to draw boundaries and say no. And share your feelings uh, with the people around you. Let them know if you're struggling or feeling down or angry, if you feel safe to do that. Naming your feelings, like right? Like we do that with our clients all the time, but name your feelings. It could be cathartic and feel you'll feel less alone uh, in what you're going through. I, I was having a rough day and I said to someone, you know, I'm feeling, I, I just woke up feeling really angry, I said to my friend. And she goes, hey, I woke up yesterday feeling really angry too. And it was so, like, we both laughed. It was like, this is so funny. Like, we both woke up feeling angry. I was mad at my cat, was mad at my husband. I was mad at work. I was mad. And just, you know, having that tantrum and saying it out loud, it made me feel so much better. Anyway, I'm wondering what additional supports might be helpful to you. So we're going to move forward. Um, we have to put on our oxygen mask first. We've been saying that, but we have to really mean it and say it. Keep yourself healthy. It makes you a better worker, person, and family member. It's not selfish to take a break. Take a break. Set a limit. A break gives us time to transition to our family, 
to break the cycle of being in a difficult situation, reflect, and maybe find more energy. It's also, again, this boundary issue, your client's needs are not more important than your own needs and well-being. You're holding up a community of people in the work that you do each day, and it's important to remember that you pay attention to the needs that you have. Working all the time doesn't mean that you're going to make your best contribution. Sometimes I fall into that trap. I work for hours and hours until my eyes get blurry and I'm on the computer and then I start making mistakes and my work isn't very good. So taking time off when you can't, when you can, it, it helps not only to prevent compassion fatigue and burnout, it can also leave you feeling refreshed and better at your job when you return. And always remember that there are other people who are helpers who can offer their support in this situation. It's really something I see a lot of, maybe, maybe you see it in your workplace, maybe not. Um, that feeling that I'm the only one who can make this call or drive that client or fix this problem, whatever it may be. And finally, I, I do want to just say to everyone as a reminder, our work is vital to our communities going through this time at all time. And if we have support, we can use our strengths and gifts to make a difference. Remember, we're all in this together. Give support where you can and take support when you need it. So, oh, see, my effort to be perfectionistic and I slipped my slide. My slide slipped, but it's fixed now. Um, so in summary, I'm hoping I've planted some ideas today about the normal experience of getting in, uh, the support that you need. We all need support at some point. The expectations we have about ourselves and our shoulds can get in the way of asking for help. By noticing our shoulds and self-expectations, we could check the thinking to see if we're putting a little too much responsibility on our shoulders. We talked about how to get the support you need by asking, what's my challenge? Who can help me? What do I need? And how can I get the support that I need? With some self-compassion and reflection, we can overcome any barriers we have in getting support and see help as the positive four-letter word that it is. <laughs> and finally, just remember that getting support is a sign of strength. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I hope that we can all get the support we need as we need it. I wish you well on your journey ahead. Together, we can do this. We can do this. We have about two minutes for questions or comments if anyone would like uh, to put something out there. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank Zechner. Um, if you could please move the, the slide over to our QR code. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we are funded through SAMHSA and as, as part of uh, receiving this funding, we're required to submit data relating to the quality of this event. So if you could please, if you're able to use your QR code and scan the QR code um, to complete our short brief survey. I, I will also email a link um, to, uh, to all participants today, um, a direct link to our evaluation code. Um, if you have any questions, we have about a minute. Um, so I see in the chat, this recording will be available um, later on this week. And I will also send certificates of completion for one hour of uh, professional development or training hour. Um, so someone here is saying, thank you for the presentation. She took the time to do this for herself today and glad that she did. Yes, at times also um, learning about ways to, um, to care for ourselves is also part of our self-care, wouldn't you say? Dr. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And someone has the pre-ask and the mm -hmm. pre-ask is like when you ask for help, but think about the pre-ask as being the planning for asking for help. So that is, I know I'm going to go through a tough time. I know that I've got like three things on that day and I'm going to ask ahead of time to say, you know what, I think I'm going to be stressed out on that day and I'm going to need some extra support. I do the pre-ask with my husband where I say, 
I want to be off the hook for dinner tonight because I've got I've got a webinar and I have, you know, three meetings. Um, yes, so that's the pre-ask. Basically, it's just planning in advance for support you might need uh, in the moment. And I think the slides will be available, right, Kadi? Yes. Also, we will send a link um, once our slides are uh, uploaded to our website. I will also send a link to the recording as well as our presenter slides. Um, Yes. Thanks, everyone. I really thank you so much for your participation. It, it, it's always a much nicer webinar when we have uh, comments and questions and interaction. And I really am grateful for that. Thank you. Yes. Th and thank you all for attending. I hope um, everyone have a healthy and happy holiday as well as our best wishes for the new year. And um, if you have any questions, I will post my email in the um, chat box in case anyone has any other questions um, regarding our center or any certificates or links to um, our presentation. Um, so uh, I, we're at the top of the hour, so we will respect everyone's time and I will um, wish you well. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Happy holidays, everyone. Take care.